I plan in this talk to show you some experiments on the reflection, refraction, and polarization of light. And I'll start off with this apparatus here to show you some effects with which you're probably uh, quite familiar. Uh, I've got a tank here, and the water in the tank has got some fluorescent in it. That makes it possible to see a beam of light passing through the water. We've got over there a source of light, an arc, and a stop by which we can direct quite a narrow beam of light through the tank. Well, now, if I could have the lights down, please. Uh, Mr. Coates will turn on the arc lamp, and I think you'll see that beam passing along through the water. And the most familiar effect of all, if he holds a mirror in the tank, he can reflect that beam of light. The angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. He moves as he bends the mirror round. The next effect is that of refraction. Uh, we've got a prism here, and if we place that prism in the path of the light, you will see that uh, it, the beam is bent downwards. It's a very fat prism. It has to be, because we must have a difference in the refractive indices, the glass being greater than that of water, is not as great a difference as when the glass is in the air. So we need quite a fat prism to get a reasonable angle. And it's been down, of course, because the light travels slower in the glass than it does in the water. Uh, as the advancing wave comes along, the bottom side of it is held down by traveling slower, and the whole wave, as it were, wheels round and turns towards the bottom of the tank. Well, now, to show you the next effect, we'll replace that single stop by a diaphragm with five holes in it. That will rather simulate uh, five rays of light, if you like, going through the water. And now, if Mr. Coates places a lens, a convex lens, which is thicker in the middle than it is at the edges, in the path of the beam, those five rays are brought to a focus. That's the focusing effect of a lens. The lens is like a prism of varying angle. In the middle, the two sides are parallel and the light beam goes straight through. Halfway towards the edge, they make a prism of rather small angle, and so the light is bent more. Right at the edge, the prism is still steeper, the light is bent still more, and all the rays are brought to a focus like that. The corresponding effect with a mirror is one which we get with a concave mirror like this. Now you see, as Mr. Coates holds uh, that mirror in the path of the rays, again the middle ray goes straight back, those towards the edge are bent inwards and the ray is brought to a focus. If that were a motor car headlamp, we'd place the lamp where the focus is there and the rays then would be shut out from the headlight as a more or less parallel beam. The other kind of lens is, of course, a concave lens, a lens which is thinner in the middle than it is at the edges. In this case, when a parallel beam of rays passes through the lens, the outer rays are bent outwards. We get what we call a virtual focus, the light appears to come from a point behind the lens. If Mr. Coates now places that lens in the path of the rays, uh, you will see them being spread outwards. They appear to come from a point behind the lens. If we held such a lens up in front of the landscape, we'd see a little landscape looking as if it were just behind the lens. Well, those are some familiar optical effects. Could I please have the lights up now, and we'll pass over to this apparatus here. I propose now to show you some further effects of reflection and refraction uh, with the apparatus that I've got here. This is a tank with water with a little 
fluorescein in it again, so that we can see the path of the rays. I can project a beam of light when I switch on here, from this lamp, onto this mirror, which reflects the beam straight down into the water. At the bottom of the tank, I've got a movable mirror, so that I can reflect again at that mirror and bring this beam up and make it meet the surface of the water at any angle I like. Now, if I could have the lights down, please. I'll switch on my lamp. Now I think you'll see as I tilt this mirror, we get a beam coming up from the water and refracted into the outer air. You can see the refracted ray as a white beam on this card here. And the, of course, the more I incline the mirror, the smaller the angle is which this refracted beam makes with the surface of the water. Since the water is denser than the air, the beam is bent away from the normal when it comes out into the air. Now, still more, and you see it's coming out at quite a fine angle. Now, this is a special point I want to show you. Uh, as we turn this mirror around, that refracted beam in the outer air comes out at an angle smaller and smaller with the surface of the water, until finally we get to a point where it's running along parallel to the surface of the water. Beyond that point, it can't be refracted into the outer air at all. The consequence is all the energy of the beam has to go into the beam reflected inside at the surface of the water. You will notice that I, I bring this beam round. Uh, as it makes a finer angle, quite suddenly, the reflected beam inside gets very much brighter because all the energy is being reflected. Watch now. There, it's still closer, still closer. Now, it's just about to become parallel with the surface. Watch the reflected beam inside. There, do you see? And as there's a mirror at the bottom of the tank, the light is reflected upwards and downwards in a zigzag way. And if I tilt the mirror still further, of course, it continues to be reflected inside. I'll repeat that effect several times. I'm moving it back. There, the beam's just come out, and the reflection has largely disappeared. Now we move it back again. Now it's very nearly parallel. There, you see, the reflected beam is strong inside again. Out, in, out, in. Could I have the lights up now, please? This effect of total internal reflection is often used in optical instruments just because it's so efficient. All the light, practically every scrap of the light, is reflected a total internal reflection, though we lose something even with the best mirrors. It's used, for instance, in binoculars, uh, where you want quite a long distance, optical distance, between the front lens and the back lens. Uh, instead of having a long tube like a telescope, the light is reflected backwards and forwards inside a short tube. And that is done by internal, total internal reflection at a complicated series of glass prisms inside. This total internal reflection is also responsible, for instance, for the brilliance of a diamond. You know, they're called sparklers, simply because so much light comes back when light falls on them. Uh, you understand that the greater the refractive index, the quicker, when we incline the beam of light, does total internal reflection take place. Now, diamond has an extremely high refractive index, about the highest of any body we know. And the consequence is, you can so cut a diamond that any light that comes in the front face is totally internally reflected at the facets at the back and comes out again from the front face. You don't lose any light at all, and that's why it sparkles so much. Perhaps I could explain it with this model here. Uh, I can't, of course, provide a model with such an enormously high refractive index as a diamond. So we've had to cheat. We've put mirrors on these back faces to make sure that the light is reflected. In the actual diamond, it is always reflected 
by this total internal reflection. And if I could have the lights down, uh, I think you will see if I take this lamp and direct the beam into the model of the diamond, however it goes in, it comes out again from the front. There it's going in, you can see for the fluorescent in its track, and however I move this, that those are all going in at the front face. Now here is a beam going in at the little side passage. There you see two. That's totally internally reflected inside, and out again it comes at the front. That's why a diamond is called a sparkler. Right, could I have the lights up now, please? And then the purpose of the cut of the diamond is to ensure that every ray coming in here, as you saw in this model, comes out again to what is called the table in the front. And incidentally, that total internal reflection of these lower faces depends very sensitively on how clean they are. The important part of a diamond to keep clean is its back. It's more important than the front. It, it'll, if you let the back get dirty, the diamond will lose all its sparkle. Well now, the next experiment uh, which I want to show you depends on understanding the nature of polarization of light, of polarized light. And I was trying to explain what we mean by polarized light. You remember that if we have a light going along, say in the direction of my arm, the electric and magnetic vectors are in a plane at right angles, the direction in which the light is traveling. It is possible in various ways to select one direction of vibration. The light can, of course, vibrate that way or that way or that way as long as it's at right angles to the direction, this direction. But we can polarize the light. We can sort out, cut out all the vibrations that have a component in this direction, only leave light vibrating vertically up and down, or alternatively from side to side. Now, there's a very useful substance for doing that called Polaroid, which was developed by Land in America. It involves two tricks. First of all, finding a chemical molecule which absorbs light vibrating, say, that way, but doesn't absorb light this way. And then, coaxing all those molecules lying parallel on a screen so that only one kind of vibration can go through the screen. Here is a piece of this Polaroid, and this white arrow here shows the kind of vibration which it allows through. It can let through light going this way, it cuts out light going that way. Here's another piece of this Polaroid, also with an arrow on it, to show the direction. Now, of course, if I hold these two arrows parallel, the light that gets through the first also gets through the second, and you can see my face quite clearly through it. But if I rotate one of these pieces round through a right angle, then of course the light that goes through the first can't get through the second. And it's blocked out completely. Turn it back and my face will appear again. Now the, the polarization effect, which I wanted to talk about, is again shown uh, by this tank here. This time, my light beam is falling on a mirror, and that mirror is so tilted as to throw the beam down, it's reflected from the surface of the water, and you will see the reflected beam going down and the reflected beam coming up. Now, what I want you to notice is this. If the reflection takes place at a glancing angle, slightly less than 45 degrees, that's the one I've got on here now, the reflected beam is completely polarized. If you'd have the lights down, please, I'll turn my uh, beam on. I hope you can see the instant beam, the reflected beam going down, and the reflected beam going up. Now, I take my Polaroid. If I put it in this way, so the light is polarized in a vertical plane, it's not reflected at all. You will see the reflected beam cut out completely. There, it's all gone, you see. Whereas if I turn it round this way, 
And so the light vibrations are horizontal. The horizontal vibrations, as it were, bounce off the surface of the water. That's always the way I remember it. It sounds natural to have a stick that's horizontal bouncing off the water when it's inclined digging into it. Now this, you see, makes no difference. There's our reflected beam as before. Vertical plane, horizontal plane. Vertical plane, horizontal plane. Can I have the lights up, please? Um, this polarization of a reflected beam um, we used in this way. A polished table reflects objects standing on it. Uh, if, however, one takes a piece of Polaroid and turns it so as to cut out the reflected light, all that reflection disappears. I've got a table over here with some objects standing on it, and we'll just uh, turn the Polaroid round, and I think you'll see reflection goes. On this highly polished table, we've got an object, in this case, a piece of calcite. Now, if I look at the na naked eye, I can see very brilliant reflections of the calcite on the surface of the table. But if I put it in my Polaroid so it only allows the vertical direction to come through, that, you'll remember, is the one that's not reflected. All the reflections vanish. Turn it round through a right angle, and they reappear even stronger because they're the favoured ones now with this direction of vibration. No reflection, strong reflection. No reflection, strong reflection, so. I find it quite useful to carry around a small piece of Polaroid with me in my pocket. For instance, if you want to look at things at the bottom of a pond or a pool, it's often quite hard to do so because the bright glare reflected by the surface of the water from the sky. But if you look at it through a piece of Polaroid, and turn the Polaroid round so as to cut off the reflected light, uh, one can see the things under the water quite clearly. This is only one example of the many interesting things one can do with a piece of Polaroid. Mm -hmm.